2 Timothy chapter 3, 1 through 5. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemous, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truth breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof from such turn away. Let's ask God's blessings upon our time. And Lord God, as we come to your word once again, we do ask that you, by the power of your Holy Spirit, that you will open our spiritual eyes, grant that we may behold wondrous things from your word, and then give us understanding as to what you are saying and what it is you would have us to do. Grant that we will be doers of your word and not hearers only. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Today I want to uh, continue and conclude, the Lord willing, our talk on what to expect in the last days. What to expect in the last days. I've said many times to you, I'll say again, that when we know our Bibles, when we know our Bibles, we know what to expect. There will be very little that occurs in the world that will take us by surprise. We'll know what to expect. And Paul is telling us here in, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, 1 through 5, and a number of other places, Romans chapter 1, 28 through 32, uh, a number of places. He, he tells us what to expect. And Jesus also, in Matthew uh, 24, which is mainly about the uh, tribulation period, he tells us what to, to ex expect. And, and so when we know our Bibles, we know uh, what to expect. And, and Paul tells us to expect in the last days, and by the way, if you look at Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, you'll see that the last days started with the Lord Jesus Christ and will end when he uh, returns. And Paul tells us that uh, perilous times are going uh, to come. And the uh, uh, word perilous uh, translates the Greek adjective C-H-A-L-E-P-O-S, and that is kalepos, modern Greek kalepos. I counted over 20 different English words that can be used to translate car le pas. And the one that I prefer out of the over 20 is the word dangerous, because this is a dangerous world. And so in the last days, uh, dangerous times are going to come. And again, Paul was living in the last days, and it, it was dangerous then. But what's going to happen is that the world is going to increase in danger. The danger is going to increase. And all of the uh, descriptions that are given here, you know, they've always been, but they're going to increase. There's going to be an increase in all of these things. Now, in our English translations, we have uh, words, phrases, and clauses. But in the Greek text, you just have words. It, it, it's, just, it's just words in the, in the Greek text. Uh, there are three nouns, uh, boasters, form, and godliness. Those, those three words translate Greek nouns. And then there is one verb, one Greek verb, high-minded. And so there are three, three Greek nouns, one Greek verb, and all of the other words are translations of single adjectives. Uh, for example, men shall be lovers of, them, of their own selves. That's, that's really one adje adjective in Greek. Uh, men will love pleasures uh, more than God. Loving pleasure, that's one Greek adjective. Loving God, one Greek adjective. Uh, 
they will be without natural affection. That, again, it's just one Greek adjective. And so we have mainly here is just uh, Greek adjectives, and, and it's one word, just one word adjectives. Once again, three nouns, one verb, the rest are, are adjectives. And Paul says, and so in the latter days, uh, dangerous times are going to come. And then for, G-A-R, gar, uh, could also be translated because. It's introducing the reason. These are the reasons that the times are going to become increasingly dangerous. And I want to repeat one that we've covered so far, and then we'll look at the uh, words that we've not covered. And the one I want to repeat, because I, I don't believe that I can, in fact, I know I cannot overemphasize this, and that is men, and, and men, once again, translates anthropos, modern Greek anthropos, and it, it, has, it means humanity, it means uh, uh, humankind, mankind, it mean, means both men and women. There is a particular word for, for, for woman and wife, there's a Greek word for man and husband, gune, woman or wife, aner, man or husband, anthropos, both men and, and women. And, uh, and then he says, and these, these are the reasons, these are the reasons that these dangerous times are going to come, is that men, women, humanity, they'll be lovers of themselves more than lovers of God. They're going to love themselves more than they love God. Now, it, it's dangerous to love anyone or anything more than, than God. Number one, because when Jesus was asked, wh what is the greatest commandment? In Matthew chapter 22, when he was asked, what is the greatest commandment in all of the law, uh, Jesus said the greatest two commandments, Matthew 22, 36 through 40, uh, these are the greatest two commandments in, in all of the, of, of, of the law. And, and that is to love God with, with all that is in you and to love your neighbor as yourself. And uh, if really, if, if we'll keep those two commandments, all the others will have no problems with all of the others. I mean, just all of the uh, other commandments will have no problems. And I understand there are about 300 different, uh, over 300 different commandments. And uh, if we'll keep those two, in, in other words, th those two really sum up all of them. If, if, in, in fact, Jesus said, on these two commandments hang all of the law. These are like uh, hinges and it, it, everything else, you know, hang on, on these. Now, this is important because, again, the greatest commandment. And so when we fail to love God and we fail to love others, and, and love is, uh, is agape, which is the highest kind of love. There is no higher kind of love. There's a there's a Greek word for, for brotherly love. There's a Greek word for uh, family love, storge. There's a Greek word for uh, friendship love, uh, phileo. There's a Greek word for uh, just all kinds of love. I mean, even you know, the love of money and so on. And then there's a word for romantic love, uh, eros or eros. Uh, and, and that is uh, a romantic love. And, and agape is the highest of all of these loves. And the love that God has for us, God so loved the world, it, it's agape. And the uh, love that we're to have uh, for others is, is, is agape. And, and just imagine what would happen in a marriage if, uh, if, if the husband obeyed Ephesians chapter 5, which is uh, where, where we're told there is that uh, husbands love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. God, Jesus Christ laid down his life for the church. And what if a husband, you know, did that with his wife, you know, regardless of what she did? And of course, Jesus' love is, is not conditional. It's not like, you know, if you do this, you do that, and so on. It's, it's like he set his love, he set his love upon us. And he, he died for us. He made the ultimate sacrifice. And if men were, you know, if they would make the ultimate sacrifice for their wives, and, and I, don't, I don't believe uh, husband, that you would have any trouble getting your wife to submit to you if she saw that you loved her as Christ lo loved the church. I, I don't think you'd have a problem with uh, submission. 
were you to do that. So a lot of marital problems would be solved uh, if husbands would, would take the initiative and love their wives as Christ loved the church. He loved the church unconditionally. He loved the church sacrificially. He loved the church uh, continuously. And if husband would do that, it would do wonders for uh, the, the marriage. And, and there are some uh, commands for the wife also. But uh, the thing is, is that when it comes to commandments, you know, you don't say, well, if she did her part, I would do my part. If, if she would submit to me, I would love her. No, <laughs> and if he would love me, I would submit. Now, you do what God told you to do, and you leave the results to him. So a lot of us, we're trying to do God's work. A lot of us, we get in the way of God. And just, just do what God told you to do, and get out of the way, and watch God work. Just watch him work. And so, when we fail uh, to love God, and I love our neighbors, we're disobeying the greatest of all of the commandments. And then secondly, is that when we fail to love God more than anything anyone else, you know, actually, what we love more than God, it becomes an idol. And re remember, I've shared with you many times, an idol is anyone or anything that you love more than God or that you value more than God. Anything that you love more than God or that you value more than God, that becomes your idol. And if you look at Exodus chapter 20, the very first two commandments have to do with idolatry. They involve idolatry. And so when we fail to love God, when we, again, they love pleasures, and, and then pleasure can become an idol. Anything can become an idol. Sports can become an idol. Your home can become an idol. Your automobile can become an idol. Your job can become an idol. Anything, any person, place, or thing that we love more than God becomes our idol. It becomes the substitute for God, and that is very dangerous. Now, one other thing, and, and this is very, very important. When we love something or someone more than God, God may take it. I want to say that again. When we love something or someone more than God, and we put that something or that someone in the place of God, God may take it. Write that down somewhere and keep it. Now, in Job's case, the opposite happened. Job loved God more than anyone or anything else in all the world, and yet he lost everything. He lost his children, he lost his property, and so on. So you have the opposite in the case of Job. And I believe, I believe that one of the reasons God permitted Satan to attack Job the way that he did. There are a number of reasons, but I believe the main reason is that God is disclosing the faith of Job. And, and sometimes God will do this. He will permit things in order to disclose. Sometimes God will permit things to disclose the evil, the depravity. And that's happening right now with Vladimir Putin. You, you, this is what can happen to when, when this is what can happen when there are no restraints on depravity. Man is depraved. Jeremiah, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Mark chapter 7, 21, 22, for from within, out of the heart, proceeds evil thoughts, adulteries, fornication, theft, murder. All of these things are from the heart. And so Depravity needs restraint. You can't have too many restraints on depravity. And did you know, you know why we're not in the newspaper today? The, rest, the restraining grace of God. You have not read about me because of the restraining grace of God. Thank God for his restraining grace. If God were to remove his restraining grace, we would be just like everybody else. 
So sometimes God is disclosing. I mean, just think of the thousands of people are dying because of the insanity of one man. And I said this a few weeks ago. It was, uh, it was Oscar, I can't think of his last name right now, Oscar. It wasn't Oscar Johnson. <laughs> but he said there's a fine line between insanity and a genius. There's a fine line between genius and insanity. You know, I was thinking, I was thinking the other day is that what Putin did, you don't have to be a genius to do that. Number one, he got Europe depending on oil, got America depending on oil from Russia, all right? And uh, he saw what, uh, what happened in Afghanistan. And so he, he saw America doesn't want war, doesn't want to fight, so on and so on. You don't have to worry about America. And then not only that, but the uh, uh, gas production. You know, a lot of things were, were stopped. All right, so, so we're not making enough product oil in, in, to be independent. And so, so he saw all of that. Listen, it doesn't take a genius to, to, be, to see, you're not going to do anything to me. And, uh, uh, and, and the other thing is the things that would have restrained him were not even put on the table. And he was told, this isn't even on the table. All of the things that would have restrained him were not on the table. And he was told that they were not on the table. And it doesn't take a genius. You'd be dumb and <laughs> you don't have to be a genius to figure out what, how people are going to respond to you and so on. And, and right now, listen, Putin does not, Vladimir Putin does not want a third world war just as everybody, you know, what else wants a third war. He doesn't want one either. But when you tell him it's not possible, that's a restraint that's removed. And he says, well, he, I've got nuclear, hey man, we've got nuclear weapons too. We probably have more than you do. But we won't mention nuclear weapons. Ah, oh, man, it doesn't take a genius. I can figure all that out. <laughs> okay, let's move on. I didn't say, plan to say all of that. But anyway, that's what makes preaching exciting. <laughs> Things come to me when I get up here that I hadn't thought about before. All right, let's, let's, let's move on. We, we, we must finish this today. <laughs> we must finish this today. All right. And by the way, one other thing. Please, this is an assignment for you. Read Psalm 73, where Asap has problems with the prosperity of the wicked until he went into the sanctuary. And, and so just, just read it. That's, that's an assignment for you. And please remember this. If you're having problems with, trouble with the prosperity of the wicked, why do people, the wicked, prosper and so on, and, and, and the righteous seem to suffer and all of that? Why? And, and of course, and David said in Psalm 34, 19, many are the afflictions of the righteous. But here's the thing to remember. The wicked, those who are lost, they're going to spend forever and ever and ever in hell. The only heaven that they're going to know is here on earth. And so let them enjoy their heaven <laughs> because it's the only one that they're going to know. And when you think about eternity, forever and ever separated from God, forever and ever in torment, let them have their heaven because that's the only heaven they're going to know. And for a believer... The only hell that you will know is here. When you make your exit, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So the only hell that you're going to know is this one here on earth. For the non-believer, the lost person who was spending eternity in hell, the only heaven they're going to know is here. So let them enjoy it because it's, it's, it's all they're going to have. All right, let's go on. I didn't mean to say all of that. Or didn't intend to. But uh, anyway, let's go on. Number, let's go to the next one on, 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 on the list now. The next, the next, the next, um, the next word on the list is fierce. Fierce. And that's in uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 3, fierce. And fierce translates a, 
a Greek adjective that means uh, violent, brutal, vicious. Violent. You can expect that. And, and this is why you have an example. I'm trying to give you an example of each one of these. Road rage. Can you imagine people having shootouts on the expressway? But Paul said, this is, you can expect this. And I saw one place where the guy's just shooting in his car with the windows up. I, you know, some people's elevator doesn't go to the top floor. Some people's elevator don't move. <laughs> and you know, listen, if you doubt the Bible, just read 2 Timothy chapter 3, 1 through 5. Just read it and then just look around you. And you, you're going to find some, some, some people you're going to find in your home described here. Some people you're going to find on your job described here. Some people you'll find in your neighborhood described here. And I pray that you won't find yourself described here. Okay, the next one on the list. Despisers of those that are good. Despisers of those that are good. Without love for good. Now, this is a, a Greek adjective I would like you to put in your, into your notes. And it's A-P-H-I-L-A-G-A-T-H-O-S. And in the Strong's Concordance, it's 865. I, 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 want you to, I want you to have this one. Uh, once again, I'll spell it again. A P H I L A G A T H O S. And that's A Phi La Ga Thos, modern Greek Thos. And, and this word, again, without lovers of good, despises, despises of what is good. Second Timothy chapter 3. In verse 3, listen to Isaiah chapter 5, verse 20. Woe unto them that call evil good. Isaiah chapter 5, verse 20. Woe unto them that call evil good, and good evil that put darkness for light, and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet, and sweet for bitter. Woe unto them that call evil good. You can expect, going forward, states that refuse to call evil good and good evil will lose federal funding. Churches that fail to call evil good, what God calls evil, if you don't call it good, you can lose your tax-exempt status. This is evil. God calls it evil, but you must call it good. And if you don't call it good, we'll take away your tax privileges. Expect that. Don't be surprised when it comes. And if you don't call evil good, in other words, if you call evil evil, you will be accused of hate speech. Bible tells us what to expect. So when it happens, don't be shocked. The Bible tells us this is, this is going to, and please, I, I'd like to read it now, but we must get through this today. I'm, <laughs> I must get through it. So this is another assignment for you. Read Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, especially, and play, pay special attention to Romans chapter 1, verses 28 through 32. Because a great deal of what's in Romans chapter 1, 28 through 32 is here in 2 Timothy chapter 3, 1 through 5. You'll see it repeated. All right? But Paul points out there also is that uh, although the people know that these things are wicked and, and, and God's going to judge them, they take pleasure in observing people do these things. That's coming. And you know, some people get upset when you drive the limit in the slow lane. 
Now, this is one lane. Okay, all right, all right, all right. But there are three lanes. One, two, three. One, two, three. And you're in number three, the slow lane. And they get behind you and get upset because you are driving the limit. And they want you to break the law. It's right here. The days are coming when, when, when they're going to despise what is good. All right, let's go on to another one. Traitors. Second Timothy chapter 3, verse 4. Uh, traitors. And, and the best translation of traitor is betrayer. It's betrayer. On, uh, it's an adjective. It, 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 traitors translate a, a Greek adjective that means uh, betrayer. In this, in this, when you think about traitor or betrayer, who comes to your mind in the Old Testament? Quickly, who comes to your mind in the Old Testament? In the Old Testament, Old Testament, betrayer. Who comes to your mind? For money. Betrayer for money in the Old Testament. Samson and Delilah. Delilah. Now, I know you're going to get this one right. The New Testament for money. Judas, yes. Judas betrayed Jesus for money. And that is going to, we can, we can expect that. Put in your notes, Matthew chapter 10, verse 21, and the parallel, Mark chapter 13, verse 12, where Jesus points out that brothers will betray brothers. And uh, this is uh, mainly during the tribulation time. But brothers will betray brothers. And f uh, f in other words, family members, fathers and, and mothers and children, they will betray one another. That's coming. That is, that is coming. Betrayers. And then heady. Here's another word. This is another Greek adjective that I'd, I'd like you to, to, to know. Let me, let me spell it for you. P-R-O-P-E-T-E-S. Now, there are two E's. One is a, a epsilon, which is pronounced E, and the other one is a eta, which is pronounced A. It's pronounced like an A. And so even though you have two E's, they're not pronounced the same way. Um, uh, and that is propetes. Propetes, P-R-O-P-E-T-E-S. Propetes. The first, eater, the first E is an epsilon, and the second E is an eta, uh, which means that, and, and this is, a, in modern Greek, it would be, be pronounced like, like an E. And, and, and now, let me give you the meanings of this, of this adjective. I want you to write these down. These are, the, these are the English words that can be used to translate this adjective. Number one, reckless. Number two, careless. Number three, thoughtless. Number four, impulsive. Reckless, careless, thoughtless, impulsive. Example. And again, you know, my wife used to get on me about mentioning names, but I can mention a name that's common knowledge. And the name that I'm going to mention is common knowledge. It's on internet right now. It's been in the newspaper. And, uh, and it's not an allegation because <laughs> they have videos of what happened. I mean, you have to be careful about, you know, usually before somebody goes to trial and all that, you will say, this person is alleged to have done this. But if we have a video of you doing it, <laughs> you, you, you didn't allege to do it. We have a video here. Sunday, November 21, 2021. Daryl Brooks Jr. at a Christmas parade recklessly drove his SUV into the people at the parade. Six people died. Over 60 were injured. That's the meaning of this word here. In the last days, people are going to be reckless. And again, you know, I want you to just, and remember, 
I gave you four C's. If we have time, I'm going to ask you for them in a few minutes. It's a how to face today's world. Remember, I gave you four C's, so get them together. <laughs> so if I have time, I, well, I'm going to take time. I'm going to ask for those four C's. And I want them in the order in which I gave them to you. Okay, and so get them together now, okay? So that when I ask, I don't want you to get distracted and miss what I'm saying here. You should, you should have those four C's memorized as to how to face today's world. And, um, but anyway, what I want you to just start paying attention to, and, and you need to be doing this anyway, it's, it's a reckless drivers. And you know what amazes me is when there's a snowstorm and there's snow, <laughs> and people are still driving over the limit. I remember, and, and I don't know why they had a hurry, uh, my wife and I, we went to a, a retreat uh, during, during the winter, and on our way home, it, we, it was a snowstorm. And do you know people were passing us, not driving the limit, but driving over the limit. And you know what? Most of them, we saw in a ditch. <laughs> you know what I mean? Where are you going? Where are you going? You adjust to the weather, but a lot of people don't. And most of those people that zoomed past us, we saw them in a ditch. So now they're in a ditch. <laughs> well, anyway, reckless. People will be reckless. People are reckless with guns right now. And, and reckless with, with, with automobiles. And, and be, be aware of reckless drivers. I'm going to give you one C. The first one I gave you is you face the day world with caution. And you have to be cautious. And Jesus said, behold, I send you forth as sheep among wolves. Be wise. Wise as a serpent, harmless as a dove. And so you have to be cautious now. You have to be cautious about where you go. You've got to be cautious. You've got to be aware of your surroundings. We're living in a dangerous world. Some of the things that we did 10 years ago, we, you can't do that anymore. You have to be cautious. Cautious how you drive. I mean, don't, don't assume that people are going to stop at, at, a, at a stop and go light or at a stop sign. Don't assume that they're going to do that. You've got to be cautious. And we face this world with cautious. That's the first C. Now, I want you to give me the other three later on. So you shouldn't have any trouble. <laughs> Probably the, the only one you remember is the first one. But I hope that's not the case. I pray that that's not the case. Please don't, don't upset my day <laughs> when I ask for these later on. All right. Okay, so reckless. And then the next one, in fact, this is the last one. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. And here we have nouns. Now, form uh, translates a, a, a Greek noun that means appearance, having the appearance. And godliness translates a, a Greek noun that uh, has to do with devotion, uh, holiness, um, uh, reverence, and so on. And so there, you, we're going to see people as we go near the end. We're gonna, they're going to have a, they're going to they're gonna look Christian. And they talk Christian. They know to talk, but they don't do the walk. And so that's to be expected. They're going to have a form, an appearance of being godly, appearance of being righteous but denying the power thereof. And Paul said, turn away from such. You know, now, you know, we're to witness to others and, and so on. We're to be in the world, but not out of the world. But you have to be careful about the people with whom you spend time. We tend to become like those with whom we spend time. If you spend time with a fool, If you spend time with a thief, if you spend time with a liar, and you know what? I know some people that lie so well 
they believe their lie and will get upset with you if you don't believe their lie. And some, I mean, I, man, why, why do you find it necessary to lie? It's not necessary. You know. All right, now, Jesus wants us to face today's world. In John chapter 17, Jesus said there, he, it's, it's the intercessory prayer of Jesus, the high priestly prayer of Jesus. It's really the Lord's prayer. Uh, you know, what we have in Matthew chapter 6 and, and, and Luke and so on, it's really the disciples' prayer. Uh, Jesus said, when you pray, this is how you pray. And, uh, you know, like, forgive us our trespasses. Well, Jesus would never pray that. Because Jesus had no sins. He had no trespasses. So he would not, that would not be his prayer. Uh, uh, you know, forgive us. And, and, and so Jesus wouldn't, that's not, I mean, we call it the Lord's Prayer, but it's really the disciples' prayer. And it's okay to call it the Lord's Prayer, but just understand that it's really the disciples' prayer. The Lord's Prayer, the prayer of Jesus, is in John chapter 17. And, and in that prayer, Jesus prayed, Father, I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. And by the way, when you read the Gospel of John, uh, the word world uh, translates uh, cosmos, modern Greek cosmos, and it has different meanings. For example, in John chapter 17, it, it, it refers to the elect, it refers to the non-elect, sometimes it's referring to people, sometimes it's referring to nature. And so as you read the Gospel of John, you have to be careful, the, the word world doesn't have the same meaning in every verse. And even in the same chapter, in John chapter 17, it has, has a couple of meanings. In John chapter 17 alone. And so, uh, Jesus prayed, Father, I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil, that thou shouldest keep them from the evil one. Sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is true. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. I said, into the world. Jesus wants us to go forth in the world. Uh, Mark uh, chapter 16, I believe it's verse 15. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Acts 1.8, and you shall receive power after that the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me. In, 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 in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, uttermost part of, of, of the world. You are the light of the world. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. You are the salt of the earth. And so Jesus wants us to face this world. He wants us to go forth into this world. But how are we to do it? And I've already given you one, is we face today's world with caution. What is the next one? Concern. All right, thank you. All right, please don't mess up now. <laughs> you face it with concern. We need to be, see, how many times have I told you when God warns, judges, or disciplines a nation, everybody suffers? Right now, everybody all over the world are being affected by what's happening in Ukraine. And this is why you, you need, and, and, and right now, listen. I said this some time ago that I believe the reason that Joe Biden was elected is God wants to show that the answers, the answers to the problems of the nations, the answers to the problem in America are not in the White House. In fact, a lot of our problems are because of the White House. Same-sex marriage. You check the sins of Sodom and Gomorrah, the sin that filled the cup, the sin that was the last straw was homosexuality. I won't dwell there. I won't, I won't dwell there. You meditate. You, take, you just take some of the things that I said and meditate on it and go ahead with it, all right? Can you do that? Shouldn't have any problems doing that. All right, so we face today's world with caution. 
we face today's world with concern. We need to be concerned about what's going on in the world. We need to be concerned about who's in office and so on. Because when God wants judges the disciplines of the nation, everybody in the nation suffers. You see it in Daniel. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were taken into captivity with the rest of the nation, the, the, the southern kingdom. These were righteous young men. But they were taken into captivity along with the nation. Read the book of Lamentations and just read what's going on there in Lamentations. When God warns, judges, the disciplines of the nation, everybody in the nation suffers. Everybody. They're affected. And that's why we need to be concerned about what goes on. You think, yeah, that, doesn't, that doesn't involve me. Oh, yes, it will involve you. And so things that are going to affect you, you need to be concerned about those things. We face today's world with caution. We face today's world with concern. What's the next one? Oh, praise God. <laughs> that God is sovereign. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's sovereign at all times and over all things. And yes, there are times when it doesn't look like he's sovereign. When Joseph was sold into slavery by his brother, it didn't look like God was sovereign. It didn't look like God was running things. It didn't look like God had the whole world in his hand. But God had purposes for Joseph in Egypt. God had a plan for the nation in Egypt. He told Abraham about it in, in, in Genesis, about the, the bondage and all of that. God had a plan. It, it was in the, it's in the furnace of affliction that God produced the nation in the furnace of, of affliction. And the psalmist said, it was good for me that I was afflicted, that I might learn your statutes. Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now, you see. So it's important to know that God is, is sovereign, and, and, and we need to be convicted that, that God is on the throne, that God is alive, that God sees everything that's going on. His, he, he, Proverbs 15, 3, the eyes of the Lord are in every place beholding the evil and the good. There's no place that we can go where God is not. David said in Psalm 139, 7 through 12, if I ascend up to heaven, you're there. In other words, no, I can go as high as I can go, you're there. I can go as low as I can go, you're there. If I go as far to the east as I can go to the west, you're going to be there and I, even if I say surely the darkness shall hide me even the night shall be a light about me there's no place that we can go where God is not there's no place on the planet where God is not in control and again there are times when we can't understand why he's permitting certain things to happen but we can know this that he is sovereign that he's in control that he has purposes to accomplish and that he's going to accomplish his purposes because the Bible says Daniel 4, 35, and all the inhabitants of the earth are regarded as nothing, and he does according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay his hand or say to him, what are you doing? Psalm 135, verse 6, whatsoever the Lord please in heaven and earth in all the deep places, he did it. Isaiah 46, 9 and 10, remember the former things of old, for I'm God, and there's none else. I'm God and there's none like me, declaring the end from the beginning. I can tell you at the beginning what the end is going to be. And I can tell you what the end is going to be because I run things. I control things, you see. Face it with conviction. But he's got the whole world in his hands. Oh, I don't understand a lot that's happening in Ukraine, but I know this. God's got Ukraine in his hands. Yeah, Vladimir Putin is insane, I believe, but hey, God's got Vladimir Putin in his hands. And when God, when God says, that's enough, that, that, that's it. <laughs> hey, 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 there's a termination date on the long suffering of God. And God said, God said uh, uh, to the northern kingdom, I Ephraim, Israel, the northern kingdom has joined himself to idols. Preach to him no more. Time is up. God said to Jeremiah regarding the southern kingdom, pray for this nation no more. I'm not going to hear you. Even if Samuel and Job were to pray, uh, I, I wouldn't listen. Time is up. There's a termination date on the long suffering of God. Genesis chapter 6, after 120 years of preaching, God said to Noah, get in the ark. Close the door. Time's up. Time's up. Oh, I, 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 I'm afraid that one day God may say to America, I've given you warnings. I've given you years of one. Time is up.
Face it with conviction. And you know what? If you have convictions, you'll have no trouble with the next one. <laughs> what is it? Courage. Courage. Oh, praise the Lord. <laughs> you made my day. You remembered the four C's. You face it with courage. And listen, you, you, and remember now, remember, you, you don't go to extremes with the sovereignty of God. We must be responsible. When the servant of God is in the will of God, obeying the word of God, he or she cannot die until his or her work is done. Daniel will tell you that the lions can't eat him up. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego will tell you that the fire can't burn him up. Peter will tell you that the sword can't cut him up. Paul will tell you that the snakes can't poison him up when the servant of God is in the will of God, obeying the word of God. Oh, that gives me courage. All I need to know when I leave home, am I in the will of God? Am I a servant of God? Am I obeying the word of God? Yes! All right, I'm all right. I'm all right. <laughs> I'm all right. I'm all right. I can't go until my work is done. And you know, I should have been, oh Lord, I should have, I mean, just the pancreatic cancer alone. Very few people, very few people survive pancreatic cancer. But I'm still here. And, and I, I, in September 7, 2021, I saw the surgeon. And he said, in all of my years in dealing with pancreatic cancer, I've never had it, anyone to have pancreatic cancer to return after seven years. You don't need to see me anymore. <laughs> but why am I here? I'm here to tell a few people, Jesus lives. <laughs> I gotta tell a few more people, Jesus saves. I gotta tell a few more people, Sunday morning he got up. I'm gonna tell a few more people that he's at the right hand of the Father. I want to tell a few more people that today, if you put your trust in Jesus Christ, you can be saved. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Uh, if thou wilt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. I've got to tell a few more people that Jesus lives. I've got to tell a few more people God is still on the throne. God is sovereign. He holds the whole world in his hands. Even when it doesn't look like he's running things, he's still on the throne. He's still ruling and he's still overruling. He's got the presidents of the nation. He's got them in his hands. He's got the baby in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. I've got to tell a few more people before I go home. Let's pray. If you're here today um, or you're listening by radio or watching by TV or internet and you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior, why not do that right now? Don't put it off another day. You don't know that you're going to be alive an hour from now. You don't know that. Why don't you just quietly say to Jesus, Lord Jesus, I acknowledge that I'm lost and that you're the only one who can save me. I believe that you died on the cross for my sins. Today, give me the grace to repent. Give me the grace to believe. Give me the grace to receive you as my Lord and as my Savior. And in your name I pray, amen. And if you prayed with me, it's important that you find a local body and unite there so that you can grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we'd love to have you here. You can call the office or go online and you'll find the uh, procedures there. All right, let's stand for the Arianic blessing, first in Hebrew, then in English. Isa Adonai Panav Eleka Veyasimleka Shalom. 
The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen and God bless you.